Thank you for joining us for our Archives Unlocked online series. My name is June and I'll be your MC this evening. We're pleased to have Ms. Sanira Beebe, a senior conservator who heads the Archives Conservation Lab at the National Archives of Singapore. Sanira is an artist who has worked with different media such as wax, fiberglass, clay, and of course, paper. A political science and history buff who binge watches the Nat Geo channel, Sanira also dabbles in art and enjoys making miniatures of little food or human heads to hone her craftsmanship skills. You can ask her about that later. I'll now give the floor to Sanira. Well, thank you, June. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Sanira, and I'm the Senior Conservator with the National Archives of Singapore. And you know, whenever I say that, I usually get a lot of questions from people who are very curious. They usually ask, what does a conservator do? You know, what do you do as a conservator at the National Archives of Singapore? And what does conserve even mean? You know, what are you conserving? You know, do we still have things in Singapore that need conservation? And they also have questions on whether you know, on how do we actually conserve? What are some of the methods we use? So I thought, you know, today, instead of me telling you what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you instead. You are going to follow me to work today. Uh, you will see what I see, and you will also help me make decisions along the way. We will have polls that will come up throughout this session, so I urge your active participation. And I'm also trying to condense the nine-hour workday into 40, 45 minutes. So if you are ready, let's go. So this is my view as I walk into work every day at 7.15 a.m. You see the lightning bolt there. That is where the National Archives, NAS for short, is. And we are really at the heart of the Civic District. We are surrounded by historical places and buildings. We have the Armenian Church opposite us. Uh, right beside us as our neighbour is the Central Fire Station. Down the road, we've got the Padang and we've got a uh, National Gallery. And to like top it all off, we are flanked by the lush greenery of Fort Canning Hill. So that makes me curious to know where you guys work. Where do you work? Is it as Instagram worthy as mine? Or you know, maybe your work view is not that much? Or maybe it's even better. So I'm curious to know. Please use the chat function and uh, just type in away. I will come back to that later. So what do we do at NAS? We have a mandate to collect, preserve and manage Singapore's public and private archival records. These have historical and national significance and we want to preserve them for the long term. We have a mission to strengthen understanding and appreciation of our history. And you will hear me say a few words today that I just want to clarify. Firstly, you will hear me say records. I don't mean uh, the gramophone vinyl records. What I mean are records that are under NAS's possession and guardianship. So these could be straight settlement records, government files, building plans and maps. So this is what I will mean when I loosely say records. And I will also use this term, digitization. So when I say digitization, it is simply the process where you take these records and you make a digital copy of them. So you will also hear these two other terms, conservation and preservation, but I will cover these later on. I would like to introduce you my team. We are known as the Archives Conservation Lab. We are eight members strong. And just a little fun fact, the longest serving member in the team has been with us for 42 years and counting. So he joined us after his national service and he's been with us ever since. And if you're looking at the picture, you should be able to guess who is that gentleman, right? He's the only one. He's always surrounded by the ladies. And this is what my lab looks like. It's a very big and beautiful space. We've got about 430 square meters and we need that space for two reasons. Number one is because we do all of our treatments in-house, so we need that space for that. And number two, it also accounts for the sheer volume of records that come through ACL. Right, so this is our to-do list for today, right? I'm not going to go through my emails, I'm going to spare you that. We will start with a tear repair in the morning, and then we will do a housing review. Then we will break for lunch, and we will go off-site. We will come back to shortlist candidates for vacancy. Right, but first things first, I don't know about you, but I do need my caffeine to kickstart my day. So the first thing I need your help with is to help me choose what should be my caffeine of choice. Should it be A, coffee, you know, because life begins after coffee, or should it be B, tea is life, right? So please go ahead and choose what will you choose if you were me, right? You had to decide for me. All right, I think we can end the poll now. So about 54, so the majority goes with coffee, 
And then we've got 46 who say tea. For all of you who chose A, I'm sorry. I don't take coffee because it gives me the jitters. So it's, it's always going to be tea for me. So I will go with the minority actually. Uh, and with that, we've made the first decision for the day. Right, so we've got our caffeine in our system. Now we've got to get dressed for the lab. So this is what our outfit of the day looks like. This is some of the things that we wear in the lab. So firstly, we've got a lab coat and an apron. So it's usually a choice between the two, depending on what is it that we are doing. So if we are doing something that's a little bit more dirty, a bit like a manual labor kind of thing, we will go with the apron because it allows for more movement. But if it's something that is a treatment-based, lab table-based, we will go for the lab coat. Covered shoes are a must because we have a lot of machinery in the lab, a lot of shear points, you know, we deal with blades, a lot of sharp objects. So we have to make sure that our toes are protected no matter what. And you will also see us usually with some form of gloves. So it's either nitrile gloves or maybe lint-free cotton gloves. It really depends on what kind of treatment we are doing. And you know, just like how you will see a hairdresser always with a comb and a scissors, right? you will always find us with some sort of a brush or a spatula with us, right? So for today, looking at our to-do list, we don't have anything that's very dirty to do, so we will just go with a lab coat. So we're going to get started. We are looking at Tong Chai Record Tear Repair Day, right? So what is Tong Chai? Just to give you a little bit of history on that, Tong Chai Medical Institution, they are still around today, but they started in 1867 and it was started by migrants in Singapore. And they provide free medical consultation and herbal medicine to all people, regardless of race, religion, or nationality. So they started off like this, and they went from strength to strength. With the help of Governor of Strait Settlements at that time, Sir Cecil Clementy Smith, and also from donations merchants such as Mr. Ganeng Singh, Tong Chai was granted this piece of land, and they operated from there for a good part, good many years. And today, you will still see that building standing, it's at Yu Tong Sen Street. But Tong Chai is no longer there. They have moved on. This building has been taken over by a retail company. But Tong Chai still stands, you know, very tall, very proud, and it still stays true to its mission of providing a free healthcare. So this is the building, actually. It's at Chin Sui Road. So given the historical significance and the contribution that Tong Chai made to the local community, their records have been selected for preservation. But when we received these records, we realized that they had not been properly stored you know, in storage and they were pretty badly damaged. So before they can be digitized, you know, they have to be digitized so that like, if any of you here are researchers, then be able to use that copy for your research and your presentations. But before it can happen, my team has to come in and make sure that the records are stable enough for handling and for exhibition purposes in future, if any. Right, so that brings us, what is preservation? So preservation is uh, the discipline of protecting materials by minimizing chemical deterioration and damage to minimize the loss of information and we want to ultimately extend the life of the cultural property. So if you see preservation as a large umbrella, a big umbrella, we've got many subsets in it. So environmental monitoring, proper care and handling, disaster planning as well. And one more thing that joins preservation as a subset is conservation. So conservation is the preservation of cultural property through repair or stabilization of these materials. We do it either through chemical or physical treatments to ensure that the records can survive in their original form for as long as possible. Right? So when NAS receives records for conservation, what we do is we attend to it piece by piece. Just like you, when you go to see a doctor, right? you will also have like a medical record card that follows you throughout your treatment. Every record that comes to us also has a similar report card that follows it throughout. So we start with photo documentation first. So that's the first thing we do. We want to capture how it looks when we receive it. And that also helps us to identify which are the areas, what kind of damages there is, and so on. And then we will do a condition assessment. So a condition assessment is where we do a very detailed report. What is it that we see? What are the problems with this record? What are the damages that we see? And how do we propose to you know, address these issues? But before we do anything to the record, we will put it through some tests and analysis first. So same thing, right? Doctor, before he will, you know, properly diagnose you with something, they will ask you to go for blood tests, x-ray, and so on. So this is similar to that. We will do a pH test, test the acidity, 
we will do an ink test, make sure if we are doing like a water treatment, the ink doesn't run and so on. And then we complete it. We will carry out the treatment after the analysis is over. And once the treatment is all completed, we end it with more photos, right? There's nothing, you know, more satisfying than a great before and after picture. I'm sure you all agree. So for today, when we are doing tear repairs, I want to introduce this material to you. It's uh, something that we use in conservation. It's called de Japanese tissue, otherwise known as kozo. It's made from mulberry plants. So if you can see in the picture, it has these really long fibers and it might look very dainty and small, but I assure you it is extremely strong and it doesn't discolor over time. It doesn't become brittle and it is amazing for mending repairs. So this is what I'm going to be using. This is the record that I'm working on, right? It's a Tong Chai record. If you can see along the spine, there's a lot of tears. The paper is like kind of coming off the spine. So when I take my kozo, if you can see in that picture, I'm holding it using my tweezer, right? So I've torn out little pieces of kozo and I have torn it just the right size so that it can overlap the tear, right? But I need an adhesive, right? To bind this kozo to the paper. So what should we use? Should it be A, wheat starch paste? Or should it be B, non-toxic white glue? Okay, I think we can end the poll now. So we've got 75% who chose wheat starch paste. It really makes me wonder what is your day job? Are you all conservators here? Actually, that's correct, right? Choosing A is correct, but let me just explain about B. Why don't we not use non-toxic white glue? Even if it's non-toxic, it's something that we use quite frequently at home. But the problem with glue is that it's difficult, if not impossible, to remove. Why am I saying to remove? Because in conservation, the idea is always that if today I do a repair, 10 years, 20 years down the road, you know, there could be more advancements. Somebody could have discovered a better way of conserving. So it should be easy for the conservator, the new conservator who is holding the record that I had conserved, for them to remove what I've done and make it better, right? And this white glue, it could darken, it could stain the records over time as well. So that's why we don't choose white glue, right? It could darken, it will stain the records over time. So if you chose A, you are correct when choosing an adhesive. So this wheat starch paste, it's very similar if you have played around with paper mache at home when you were growing up. It's very similar to that. So when choosing an adhesive, we have to ensure that it is strong, it can hold, it won't discolor over time, and it's reversible. So uh, in conservation, the principle of reversibility is extremely important because it helps us decide which treatment is selected. So when we say something is reversible, it means that it can be undone without causing damage to the object. Right, and this is also a principle that distinguishes us from restoration. That's another question I also always get. People usually ask, you know, is conservation, is it the same as restoration? But we are quite different because restoration focuses on how the item looks. Aesthetics is very important. Conservation ensures that condition of the object remains unchanged long after the treatment is completed. So how the item looks is secondary to its preservation. It's more concerned with stabilizing the object so it can stay that way for years to come. And reversibility is also an important factor because we want to facilitate retreatability in the future. So that would mean that, like what I mentioned earlier, if a conservator 30 years down the road wants to redo what I've done, they should be able to do it without causing harm to the object or the paper. Right, so an example here for you, this was like the infamous restoration of the Eke Homo in Spain. The original was done by a Spanish painter called Elias Martinez. And this is a very, very typical of traditional Catholic art. So this was a fresco painted at a church. So what the church did was over time, they saw that, you know, it was deteriorating. So they called up this part-time restorer kind of lady and she worked on that. And that's the after that you see. So we call this irreversible restoration because not only has she completely changed the painting, if we are trying to undo this damage, there's a very high possibility that we will lose the original painting as well. But that being said, um, this picture went viral, right? That little town became like a tourist hotspot. Tourists flocked there. So in NAS, 
this is the kind of uh, restoration that we focus on, right? It's reversible conservation. So if you see this, the first picture, this is a birth certificate during the Donanto time, which is the Japanese occupation. So if you note, there's a lot of tears, there's a tear repair as well. If you see there's tape that's been used to hold the paper together. So what the team has done is to remove the tape because the tape is staining the record quite severely. So that would reduce the staining so that you can capture content a little bit better. And then we also mend the test. So if we do not do anything, what will happen to this is that it will keep tearing, it will become very brittle and so on. So we can reverse this very easily with just water. They, we can remove whatever that we put on the paper, we can remove it. So just one example, just to drum in the whole uh, principle of reversibility. I don't know if you have watched this Netflix show, it's called Rust Valley Restorers. find it very entertaining is this two guys who have a backyard of rusty old cars, like vintage kind of era cars. And what they do is they take these rusty cars and then they put a few together. They give it a fresh coat of paint. They give it new wheels, new engine, new air conditioning and uh, new leather seats and everything. So on the outside, it looks like a vintage car. But on the inside, it is a modern car. Right, so that is a typical example of restoration. Aesthetics is important. But if you give a conservator a rusty old car, what the conservator would have done is to just clean it thoroughly, remove the rust, address the deterioration, and make sure that years down the road, the rusty old car is no longer rusty, but it is still an old car. The conservator will not make it look brand new. Right, so with that said, a question for you. If we have a missing word in a document, what should a conservator do? Should we use maybe like reversible paint and fill it in? Reversible paint would mean something of a watercolor medium. Or should we leave it as it is? So you have got two choices. So A would be to, yes, you know, let's paint it in. And B is, nope, don't do it. Right, I think we can stop the poll now. Right, so for the 5% of you who actually said, yes, fill it in, you are actually not completely wrong. Because in painting is actually a common practice used by painting conservators. And in private practice, when clients approach private conservators and then they request for such services. So it's actually a common practice. However, in NAS, we do not alter the original condition of the records or items in any way, right? So if you chose B, you have practice self-restraint and that's the correct answer, right? So with that, we have completed the Tong Chai Tear Repair and we are getting ready to do the housing review. Right, I have a very urgent text that just came in, right? It's from a collection owner, right? So let me just share the text with you, right? So it's a very urgent incoming text. So it says, hi, Sanira, we are accumulating some files in dubious condition. Could we have a conservator pop by the repository to have a look and advise us again how to distinguish mold, tight lines and foxing? So usually, so when there's something strange in the repository, who do you call? You call the conservators. And consultations is a very big part of ACL duties. You know, it keeps things exciting because a lot of it is unexpected. So ACL, we provide advice to NAS, NLB, and all government agencies. And we also consult on uh, environmental conditions and recommend remedial actions and address problems in storage. So before I go down to the repository, I need to make sure that I have my kit with me. So number one, very important is you have to have your mask on. You've got to have your nitrile gloves on and I have this trusty UV light. So with these, we will go to the repository. So when we go there, this is what we expect to see. So these are the usual suspects. So all repositories will have these. So number one is foxing. So foxing is when a little flex, either from light yellow to light brown to black. And this is like natural aging of paper due to acidity. So like just like humans, right? We've got age spots. This is the age spots for paper. Then we also expect to see some tight lines. Tight lines is usually because whichever institution these records came to us from, they probably you know, suffered some water damage. They were not taken care of properly, so they would have these tight lines. So we will see like running ink and all that. We also expect to see some dormant mold or mold stains. So these are usually powdery to touch some dark spots and discoloration. But dormant mold, that means it's like dead. It's inactive mold. But under the right circumstances, it can become active again. So we usually treat dormant mold with a bit more caution, right? So this is what we don't want to see. 
we look out for active mold. So active mold is very nasty, it's very dangerous, it's usually damp with fluffy growth and it will fluoresce under UV light. So that's where I use trusty lamp for. So under UV light, you will see this fluorescence. So this is what we don't want to see. So today, when we have gone to the repository, this is what we are looking at. Do you see any fluorescence? You don't, right? So there is no active mold. We have decided that, okay, there's no active mold, but we are still a little bit concerned about the mold stains that we see. So we isolate the affected records and then we take them back to our lab for treatment. I just want to make a note of caution here that when it comes to active mold, we do not actually treat them directly while they are active. So the usual protocol for active mold is you seal it, you pack it, and you put them in the freezer. So in the freezer, when they get frozen, that's when active mold becomes dormant and then we will take it out to treat it. We want to eliminate all these dormant molds. We don't want them becoming active again. So help me choose the right solvent for this husk. So that's your next question. Should it be A, ethanol? Or should it be B, bleach? Right, so we can end the poll. So for the 7% of you who chose bleach, so bleach has always been marketed as a common solution for home use. A lot of the cleaning products at home have bleach in them. But the thing about bleach is that it only works on non-porous surfaces like tiles and sinks. For porous surfaces like paper, which absorbs water, bleach doesn't work because it will remain damp. When mold is damp, they can populate and grow. So we don't want that. We don't use bleach at the lab. If you chose ethanol, the majority of you did. So good job. That's what we choose. So we work in a fume hood. Personal safety is always very important. So you see my colleague there, she is properly geared up in the proper PPE. So respirator mask, gloves, and disposable gown. We usually do a misting of ethanol solution and then we wipe them down with a sponge or cellulose wipes. Right, so with that, so we got a bit sidetracked. We're doing Tong Chai, then we got sidetracked with the mold, then now we're coming back to our housing review. So what is housing review? So we are dealing with this meteorological records from one of our collections. Our job doesn't end when we conserve the record. We also have to determine what is the best way to store these records that we have completed conservation for. Proper archival quality housing would mean it must be acid-free. It must not interact with the paper or our records in any way. They must stay that way for you know, as many years to come. So housing usually means folders or boxes. And these are not something you can just pop down to a stationery store and buy. These are specially made for archival purposes. Right, so I've uh, taken a picture of the records there. It's an oversized record, so you see my palm size as a reference. And that machine that you see, that is our fancy zoomed cutting machine. So what we do is we design it, design what kind of box we want, and then we feed the design to the machine, and the machine cuts it up in a couple of minutes flat. So just a fun fact, previously, the team used to make boxes and folders by hand. So it's a lot of precision and it takes up a lot of time. So the machine helps us in that a lot, right? So these records are in generally stable conditions. Help me choose a design that would best fit these records, right? So I've got two designs for you. Should we place the records facing up or should we lie them flat? Okay, we can stop the poll now. So about 28% chose A. So what happens when we actually put the records standing up? If you see that the matte records, they do not really have a hard cover. So if you put them facing up, what happens is that there's a lot of pressure on its spine and it can cause like warping or deformity in the records. So we do not want that. And it's also a bit difficult for the collection owners to come and take out the cover and then look through to access a record. So usually we will go with B, which is what the majority of you chose. So good job. Such design allows for stacking. Right, we can stack a few in the shelf and there's no pressure or tension for the book spine. And it's also very easy for the collection owner to come and access whatever records that they need. Right, so with that, we're done with our morning. This is the time we will break for lunch. I'm not going to ask you to choose my lunch for me because it has to be like a really quick one. We have to go off-site. So where are we going? We are going to check out the Human Nature Exhibition so we are going there before it actually launched. But as I speak to you now, currently the exhibition is live. So if you have not checked it out, we strongly encourage you to go and check it out. 
But before the exhibition launch, we were asked to come down to do a condition check. Because the Human Nature exhibition, it exhibited a lot of our botanical prints, manuscripts, maps, together with herbarium and natural history specimens. So we had to ensure that all these items that are exhibited alongside our paper collections from NAS and NLB, it is safe. So what do we mean by safe? Just want you to think about that for a few seconds. While I show you what we are looking at, these are our furry friends for the afternoon. Does any of you have any taxidermy at home? I'm curious to know, what do you have? Where do you display it? I find them quite fascinating. So we are inspecting these taxidermy items. These are from the Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum. When we are looking at them, what are we looking for? So I give you two options. Should we look out for creepy crawlies in this taxidermy? Or should we look out for pollutants or hazardous substances in this taxidermy? We can end the poll now, right? Did any of you think it was a trick question? Because it was, it's both. We look out for both, right? So if you chose A, you are correct. If you chose B, you're also correct. Usually in taxidermied items, the common pests that we find are like moths, beetles, and cockroaches. And so when we are inspecting them, we are looking for signs of this kind of life. Is there any insect eggs, any adult insects, any visible damage? Do we see anything having eaten away at the skin? That kind of thing. We also look out for hazardous substances like arsenic, a lot of pesticides because these were used heavily previously to treat the skin for the taxidermy. So we look out for these as well. And we also look out for dust and mold because we do not want any kind of cross-contamination when these items are displayed alongside our paper collections. Right, so with that, what we do is we make some recommendations on environmental conditions, safe handling, how to handle taxidermy safely for the staff, and we compile assessment findings then we will convey these to the curators of the exhibition accordingly. Right, so with that, we've gotten to the last item on my to-do list, which is to sort out potential candidates for the assistant conservator position that we have in the lab. Are you ready to hire with me? Let's go. We advertised like a few months ago. Our resumes have poured in. We are looking to fill a spot for an assistant conservator who is expected to implement interventive and preventive conservation work, ensure paper-based archival records are conserved and preserved according to industry best practices, participate in initiatives to raise the standard of conservation through development and training, learning and instruction. I've done a bit of homework, I have sorted the applicants into two categories. I've got one category where it's the fresh graduates with a master's or a bachelor's in conservation or related collection care experience. Then I've got fine artists who have international experience working on different mediums such as painting, sculptures and installations. So out of these two groups, who should I shortlist for interview? Okay, I think we can stop. So it looks quite straightforward, right? 78% of you went with the first category. But in reality, what I would do is I would look out for both. Because the fact is, there's a very small pool of conservation graduates locally. We do not have a local degree program for conservation studies at all in Singapore. So if you wanted to study conservation, you have to go overseas. So we try to buffer that gap by looking out for proficiency in the arts, chemistry or other related fields. Strong interest in and an appreciation of the arts, culture and heritage is needed. At the end of the day, it's always about fit. How well you fit with the team, you know, what skill sets you bring to the table, what kind of strengths you bring to the team, right? So based on this, keeping all this in mind, I will then proceed to shortlist a few candidates for the interview. So with that, we are done with our to-do list. We even did a little bit more, right, with the mold situation. So now the important question is, it's five o'clock. Should I stay on, do a little bit more work, or should I go back home? So I'm going to ask you to decide this for me. Should it be A, hustle, stay on, do more work, or should it be B, go back home to my family? Maybe we can stop the poll now. So for the 12% of you who chose that I should hustle, I should stay on and do more work, I have a message from Yoda for you, right? So if you chose A, you are simply savage, right? I've been here since 7.30. So my heart is with the other 80% who decided that I should go home. You know, I love what I do. I need to rest, recharge so I can come back energized, motivated, focused to do it all over again. So I'm going to go home to my family. So with that, thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you had a good sneak peek into a typical day at the Archives uh, Conservation Lab. And together, we even conserved uh, a few bits of history together. 
I just have a little PSA. If you're a conservator listening in, you could be from any part of the world, right? We'd like to be friends with you. Come and say hi to us. Drop us an email at conservation at nlb.gov.sg. Thank you.